Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Thank you for joining us today or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from around the world. The Fowler is proud to present today's program, The Good Kings, as the first in our new series, Off the Press, in which we invite you to join the Fowler to hear from UCLA professors and cultural leaders from beyond the university about their recently published books, Hot Off the Press. Today, we are pleased to welcome best-selling author and UCLA Egyptology professor, Dr. Kara Cooney, for a program about her newest publication released this month by National Geographic, The Good Kings, a provocative narrative about the impossible attractions of masculine rule, both yesterday and today. Cooney's book focuses on five ancient Egyptian pharaohs. At a time when democracies around the world are threatened or crumbling, Cooney will explain why Egypt still has much to teach us about our continued proclivity to choose leaders in the mold of strong men, whether we call them kings, presidents, or chairmen. Dr. Kara Cooney is chair of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures and professor of Egyptology at UCLA. A specialist in social history, gender studies, and economies in the ancient world, she received her PhD in Egyptology from Johns Hopkins University. In 2005, she co-curated Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs at LACMA. Cooney's first book, The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatshepsut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt from 2014, presented an illuminating biography of Egypt's least well-known female ruler. Her When Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt from 2018 was published by National Geographic Press. Before we get going, I have a few quick technical bits of housekeeping. Once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options and then select side-by-side -side mode so the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during this program, please do submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions that you would like to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's all for me. Over to you, Kara. Thank you, Bianca. Let me share my screen with a PowerPoint that I just changed <laughs> because this is the way. Um, after trying to exert authoritarianism in my own home over my 11 year old son, which was ultimately unsuccessful. So, um, Welcome to all of you. I'm sorry this could not be in person, but that means that we get to invite more people than we would normally. And um, let's jump in because Bianca tells me we have a hard out at an hour and I know how I am um, one to go on and on. So I'm gonna try to keep it, keep it short. So the topic of today's presentation and the topic of the book is uh, rulers, leadership, and how we want to fall um, into their safe embrace, the safe embrace of our fathers who will, who will keep us fed and warm and keep everything running right in the world. And what is this seduction of authoritarianism? And what could a simple Egyptologist have to tell you about any of that authoritarianism? Um, well, this book was written in the fire of 2020 in my home in this room right here. And it is, um, it, it is, uh, a topic that unfortunately has not gone away from the world and uh, this specter of absolute power uh, is, is something that is constantly challenging us. And that is where this, this book is coming from. So we start with the idea that a ruler can be divinized. A ruler can be someone to whom you perform an imperial cult or a someone about whom mythologies of, of divinization are written or somebody for whom massive statues are built. And Egypt, I would argue, excels and is perhaps the best civilization in the world at the optics, at the packaging of such a ruler to not only be necessary, but to be good and moral, the only true and right way to, to be led and to be ruled. Egypt seems to do this best, and it's something that we continue to consume ourselves and be very attracted to. And as Bianca pointed out, I was one of the curators of the King Tutankhamun exhibition that opened at LACMA in 2005 for that King Tut reboot, if you like, and to see people banging down the doors to consume that authoritarianism, which is what it is, um, is, is illuminating as well. So you may ask, well, why does this have anything to do with the modern world? We're not like Egypt, um, we would never, and this is something that I, I like to do. I like to put the past and the present together. I like to use the lessons that the past has to teach us and to apply it to the modern world. 
and to provocatively ask. So you think you don't have a king. If somebody has $300 billion, that would be Jeff Bezos right now who has $300 billion. Does that mean that they're like a king, even though we, our ideology doesn't allow a king? You know, the ancient Roman ideology didn't allow a king either. And they called their king Caesar or Augustus or all kinds of made up names, but that doesn't mean they didn't have absolute power. So as we work with what um, our minority rule in the United States is, and I don't think it's a democracy um, or a republic, those words are very ideologically fraught. Um, I think we're dealing with minority oligarchic corporatism. Um, there's all kinds of things you could you could name our current system, but um, we'll let that one we'll let that one haunt us for a little bit. But we divinize our rulers too. And those rulers are caste presidents. Um, sometimes those rulers could be religious rulers. There's, there's all kinds of ways of divinizing. Um, you could blast their faces into the side of a mountain sacred to an indigenous group of peoples in the United States. And all of these are methods of, of divinization. And that leads me to the, the reason that I wrote this book, which was to provide a critical view of these kings for a consumer public that positivistically consumes them and for a scholarly academic group that non-critically examines them while saying things like the past is not political, we shouldn't impose our modern uh, issues onto the ancient world. And instead, this book is very much a study of how the authoritarian patriarchal system that we live in today is very similar to the ancient authoritarian world of the past and even to the ancient Egyptian past. And you might say, but that's impossible, Kara. How could you say that? Because the ancient Egyptians, they were all these crowns and had this strange ideology with different divinities that look very bizarre. And how could they possibly have um, anything to do with us and our world? Well, what I will say to that is this strange ideology makes it all it does right now for the moment that we're in right now watching this simple the simple zoom discussion is it helps us to see how the ancient Egyptians are so different from us and it allows us to see something that we refuse to see in our own world. Authoritarianism systems of rule, this is the water in which we swim. And if it's the water in which we swim, you don't look around and go, oh, there's some more water and there's some water. It's something that's invisible to you in many ways. It's almost impossible to see. When you, however, look at an ancient culture that has a very strange ideology, a different way of running things, a different way of setting up and packaging their authoritarian power, you will be able to see it like that. You'll be like, ah, there it is. I, I note it and I can see it. And what I do in this book is I mark it in the ancient world and then I come back to the modern world and I, and I equate the two. And this is a constant. And that is why the subtitle is um, Absolute Power in the Ancient World and Today. Because I would argue that if the ancient Egyptian ideology and their crooks and staves and crowns and, and different um, mythologies of Horus and Seth and all of these things worked for them, then what works for us around the world in a very globalized world, as we all seem to be careening towards authoritarian power together, is an ideology of democracy or an ideology of republic. Um, this ideology is allowing the IMF to give money, UNESCO to, to give money, USAID to say, okay, I'm going to give a massive lump sum of money to X, Y, or Z group because they are a democracy and they have these, um, uh, they, they have a rule of law that allows people to, to be represented. There, there are free and fair elections. All of these things work on a gradient, however, and all of these things can allow much more minority rule of the few in an oligarchic way than we would like. Um, authoritarianism changes with the times. And while we would never wear crooks and flails, we also wouldn't wear curly haired wigs and big capes and, and other things. The authoritarian outfit today, it's, it's even outmoded to wear a military uniform. That's the authoritarian outfit of the 60s, the 50s. That's, that's considered the military junta and something you don't wanna be associated with. Our military uniform of the 70s has turned into a businessman suit and tie. And that is the way that the authoritarian leader presents himself so that he, and it is usually a he, looks like a president, a prime minister, a chancellor. And this is very much our ideology. So I want to equate the, the crooks and staves of Egypt with the, the big tie, the red tie or blue tie, um, the comb over, the business suit of the modern day. 
Um, and, and note in the picture, you know, some people like Duterte, they don't want to wear the tie, that's too much. And he's going to go more every man and wear the, the shirt and collar. Iran often shows the same. So going back to Egypt, you will see that the king is represented it, as a superhuman, super size scale, a, a massive being, something that you, you have a hard time containing in your mind. He is beyond human. And this, this changes through time. Sometimes that superhuman image is a pyramid. Sometimes it is an actual massive body. And so you can see that the ancient Egyptians with their 3000 years of authoritarian rule under pharaonic power, and of course that rule continued for much longer after that and arguably still continues today. You, you see that sometimes it's cool, it's fashionable for the king to represent himself as a pyramid. Sometimes it's fashionable for the king to represent himself in a more religious manner. Sometimes it's fashionable to show himself as a massive colossal statue. So there is fashion in ancient Egyptian authoritarianism as well. The monumentality changes. There is um, an architecture that is associated with authoritarianism. And we were just um, discussing in, in class, somebody pointed out a picture, they're like, oh, it looks brutal. It looks like a 1960s sort of totalitarian image. These are things that we mark as well. But what I would like you to also do is note the water in which we, you swim that is invisible to so many of us. Um, though we are going through the great American awakening, as I like to call it, for white people at least, um, seeing things that we had not uh, always seen previously. But uh, you know, the temples, the monuments, all of these things are the trappings of an Egyptian kingship and arguably of a kind of kingship in the world today in many different systems. In ancient Egypt, the other thing that we are so very attracted to is a continuity of kingship, uh, a leadership that lasts for over 3000 years. It, it seems to us to do so unchangingly. It seems that every time there is a fall, they're able to repackage it and put it back together again and make it into something that was never lost, that is able to come back more perfected, more clean than it was before. And we associate that kingship with the divine body. Many systems of rule associate the kingship with the divine body, generally a masculinized body um, in some way. Here we have two Egyptian examples, one on the left of Khafre with the hawk, which is a symbol of kingship that, that is a part of his body. And if you look at it from the top, you see there's no definition between the body of the hawk and the head of the king. And then to the right, you see an image of I can never tell if it's Amenhotep III or Hatshepsut, um, but it is an image of the divine birth. That is sexual intercourse happening between the queen and Amun-Re, a very discreet touching of hands, but it is a claim nonetheless that the king is of the body of the God. His body is absolutely divine. And all of this, this um, being touched by the heavens, being given the, the sanction to do as, as one needs, allows all kinds of things to happen within a society because you are touched by the gods. The gods tell you what can and cannot do. You're able to communicate with the gods better than other people. So even if you're smashing skulls into tiny bits and there's blood and gore everywhere, it is justified. It is, it is the way something is, is meant to happen. And of course, this continues to happen in the world around us as people tell us they need their AR-15 for a revolution or they need to keep ca capital punishment in this country as a deterrent, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the, the leader of the ancient Egyptians shown without a shirt, shown very strong and powerful is something that we also understand. Um, you could put, I could put uh, Barack Obama on here playing basketball. I've got FDR, whom we know was um, uh, disabled through um, sickness as a child, through polio in a car, uh, often a car he drove himself to show that power. So even though it was difficult for him to walk, he's put himself into a conveyance of masculine power. And of course we have a shirtless Putin because who doesn't want to compare that to Thomas the third, but I think the, the meaning is clear what we're getting across that forever youth. And then the other thing we cannot forget, and something that is very much the, uh, the topos of this talk, is that balance between a leader and the elites. Because no leader, no matter who you are, can do anything with one decision. This is not the way power works. Power has a foundation. Power is a give and take. Power is a balance. And that balance depends on a patriarchally organized elite. Um, a group of men, the rule of the fathers who are there to, to help us see our way forward and to understand 
where we fit into the hierarchical scheme of things. And so all of this ends up seducing us. Um, and as an Egyptologist, then I can see it very clearly that that seduction works very well through the optics and packaging that the ancient Egyptians provided for their own people. And it still continues to work on our minds today, such that when the tomb of Tutankhamun was uncovered in 1922, we still can't look away. And the centennial of the discovery of this mass of riches, a, a coffin of 269 pounds of solid gold, is uh, uh, something that, that continues to draw our gaze. So the, the book includes five different kings and people often ask me why I chose these different kings. Um, the reason, and I could have chosen more in addition, but the reason is if autocracy, um, uh, authoritarian leadership is a wave that goes up, everything that goes up must come down. And so we're looking at a series of bell curves over 3000 years of Egyptian history. And I wanted to pick those men at the top of the bell curve, those leaders who are able to create the most power and to show over a long duration of power by looking at their fathers and their grandfathers and then looking at the, the men who ruled after them to see how that top of the wave is already sowing the seeds for the leaders, families or dynasties own destruction. That it's built in, into this patriarchal authoritarian system, diminishing returns, a, a fall um, that, that will come. Um, the, the wave must crest. And so that is what this is a study of. It is a study of beginnings, um, the height, and then the endings and how it falls apart, then how you reconstitute it again and how it all falls apart um, repeatedly. And we will see that um, some five times. The chronology is here. Um, I think you can Wikipedia me as I go. Um, I didn't start at the very beginning and the very end, but uh, wanted to really hit the tops of those waves. So we will start with Khufu, whom all of you know as the builder of the Great Pyramid of Egypt and on the Giza Plateau. And I want to start out with the idea that the pyramid is not built because you can, it's built because the king has to build it. And I'm not the first to come up with this idea. This is an idea of the Egyptologist John Baines at the University of Oxford, now Professor Emeritus. And it's a, a wonderful notion that you build something this big, demanding this many resources from your people, because what you had before, and this is the fourth dynasty, the very beginnings of the fourth dynasty, when what you had before isn't working the way that you need it to anymore. You, you need a, a reboot. You need something to reinvent the kingship. And you see at the beginning of the fourth dynasty, Khufu's father, Snefru, making three attempts at the first straight-sided pyramid. These pyramids, if you put them together, would exceed the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau in terms of volume of stone. And if you look on the insides of these structures, you will see uh, all kinds of research and development, experimentation. Um, they're trying to figure out how to float granite chambers inside of a limestone expanse. They're trying to figure out what the proper angle is. They try to make it very steep at the beginning, as you can see on the left-hand side, and they continue it in, in the middle pyramid, the bent pyramid at Dashur, and then they realize that they need to let that angle come down a little bit to some 40 degrees. So there's, there's a lot of fighting with what the perfection of the vision is that they want and settling for reality on the right with the red pyramid. But think of this as something hyper-modern. We look at these pyramids and we see one of the great wonders of the world. You don't see research and development, NASA going to the moon, um, trying to figure out how to do something that has never been done before, something that is meant to create a shock and awe before you, because that's what these pyramids were meant to do. They were meant to be weapons of the mind in stone, such that when you look at this pyramid, maybe you're at a high elite and you're able to get right next to it, and you look up this expanse as it's being built, maybe when it's being covered with the churro white limestone that would have given it a fine white, white color, it would have worked upon your mind in a way that you think that the person who ordered this and had this built is superhuman, is beyond human, is something that is so special and miraculous that you can't quite understand it. And these weapons of stone, every time somebody looks at one of these pyramids and says that they were built by aliens, I guarantee you if Khufu was looking down, if he can look down from wherever he is or look up if he's in an underworld, he would think to himself, ha ha, it's still working 
on the simple human mind today. That's exactly what I wanted this to do. And it is still functioning in the way that I want it to function. Um, but what then, as I worked through the first um, chapter about Khufu in my book, is the cost for building something like this? What are the long-term repercussions? What are the, the unexpected consequences of building such a structure? Because if you look at the inside of Khufu's pyramid, and there has been in the news of late discussion that there are other chambers um, shown through uh, Muon examinations, uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A, that um, have not been examined and not been discovered, but there is potentially more within this, this pyramid structure. But what's there is enough. These are, these are granite chambers floating within limestone, that the tonnage of which should crush them. But they don't, they don't crush these empty chambers. Instead, they, they last and are able to stay empty and, um, and there for people to enter into. And that's because of the way they're built, the incredible engineering that goes into this, a whole lot of trial and error, a whole lot of failures, many of which you can see in Khufu's father's pyramids, um, three of which were needed to get things right. Khufu's got a horrible vaulted grand gallery. He's got two burial chambers, doesn't seem clear what exactly they, they are for. One is called the queen's chamber. Who knows if that was for his queen? Probably not, since there are queen's pyramids surrounding this structure. And there are these little telescopes, let me go back really fast, these little telescopic channels that go off to the north and to the east, one to the constellation of Orion, one to the constellation uh, in the east, to the constellation of um, the circumpolar stars, sorry, to the north. And these telescopic chambers, no human body can fit into them. How did they build them as, so perfectly? Um, the e Egyptologists have sent a robot through these things trying to figure out what's going on. Um, th these are structures that, if you are one of the few elites who's able to stand on the inside, are structures of miraculous intent. Uh, here's some images of the pressure, the, the, uh, the structures that you have to build on top of an empty uh, rectangular chamber so that the tonnage of the pyramid doesn't crush it. You have these relieving chambers above. Um, the, the way this was engineered with exact precision to uh, magnetic north, um, how they were able to do this, you can read Kate Spence of the University of Cambridge talking about stellar orientation and how these things were done. But in my first chapter, what I focus on is how all of this creation of a divinized king, more perfected and superhuman than you had ever seen before, does nothing more at the top of the wave of making it crest because what you are creating is an empowered elite, an elite whom you have to pay a whole lot of money, an elite whom you have to allow to hand their expertise off to their sons, an elite that, that could walk away from you, an elite that could throw you under the bus in some ways and, and needs to be treated well. Once the king builds this pyramid, he's building what I call a mortuary industrial complex, something that in some ways is bigger than the king himself and that will overpower the king in no short time. So you see even at Khufu's mortuary complex where all of the, his elite streams are supposed to be laid out in nice neat little rows, some of them are bigger than others. There, there, there are suddenly some tombs on the horizon that show the reach of these elites. And from this moment on, from, from Khufu's pyramid on, the elite's tombs will continue to get bigger and the pyramids of the kings will continue to get smaller. So as soon as you build the biggest, best thing you can possibly build, that's the last time you're going to build it. By building it, you have destroyed your, your actual economic, social, military, and ideological power. And that is the conundrum that I really wanted to focus on in that first chapter. Because if you look at Khufu's son, and there is another son in between, but we'll, we'll skip him for now, because Khafre, his son, built on the Giza Plateau next to dad. If you look at Khufu's son and you look at the inside of his pyramid, I hope you can see that there are no floating chambers inside of the expanse of limestone that you have a simple burial chamber put into simple bedrock that does not need any fancy engineering. It's just there for, for a, a very small amount of people to enter into. And where more wealth and money is going now is to the statues of the king because he puts dozens of statues up in his mortuary temple and into the temple. The temple is a place that's getting bigger. It's a place that is including more empowered elites. And we don't see the, the king 
um, celebrated as much. And you might say, well, yeah, but it's as big as Khufu's. Khafre's pyramid is still huge and tall. And you would be right, but Khafre's cheating. He's building on a higher part of the plateau. He's building arguably using superstructure of the plateau to, to give himself more volume. And it looks taller, but it is not. And if you look at the inside of the pyramid, the difference is, is very, very clear. And then following Khafre, we have Menkaure, whose pyramid is much smaller in comparison. And you can see in your mind's eye the tableau of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkaure, and how they get smaller very quickly. As soon as that great pyramid is built, it's all downhill from there. And again, the burial chambers are there in the bedrock. Um, the, the point is, is that the engineering itself out-engineers its need, out-engineers its existence. And I do love comparing pyramids to our American space program, that as soon as you get to the moon, um, you don't need to go to the moon anymore. It's been done and that ideological feat has been attained. And now the cost of going to the moon and enriching all of the people who allow you to go to the moon becomes so high that you actually can't continue to go to the moon. Now, there's other costs to building this pyramid, which are very interesting as well, because Khufu, the builder of the Great Pyramid, is remembered rather without fondness. He's remembered as a megalomaniacal king who enjoys cutting off human heads for sport and entertainment, who has to be put in his place by his elites, who has to be told, no, no, my lord, where I know how to, how to reattach a head, that's great, but we're not gonna do it to human, Let's use a goose instead. And the king thus chasing goes, oh, yes, yes, of course. And we have many stories like this that last about the kind of personality that is needed to create the kind of building that is the Great Pyramid, 50 stories of stone, a mountain of stone that uh, was not matched in any sort of real way, taking out all the church spires and things like that until the Eiffel Tower in the late 19th century. Now, the other, the other thing is the wave is cresting and you see that bell curve starting to find its way down is that once the fourth dynasty ends and it ends very quickly after Khufu and that will be a pattern that you will see repeated for all of the kings that I'm talking about that, that as soon as you hit that top part, the seeds for the destruction are sown and it's going to find its demise quite soon thereafter. The fifth dynasty kings are going to try to disassociate themselves from the fourth dynasty that came before. Yes, they are still building pyramids, but much smaller, not um, demanding the resources of their, of their country in a monolithic way, to, to mix the metaphors there. But instead, they're, they're splitting those resources up. They're building temples that include their elites, and their pyramids are much smaller, as if to say, oh, no, no, we're not associated with this administration. That's the administration previous. They did those things. That way, we are doing something new. And the fifth dynasty does indeed set itself up as a lineage of priest kings um, rather than a lineage of um, superhuman gods incarnate. So we, we leave the fourth dynasty behind, we skip ahead and we're going to go to the end of dynasty 12 and to the height of power of dynasty 12 and to a particular king named Samwasra III. And I don't, um, I don't have time to get through all of these five kings with as much um, information as you would like. And I really have like 20 minutes left. So we're gonna fly through some of these things um, letting the pyramids of the fourth dynasty ground us in a little bit more authoritarianism. So Samwastra III uh, is of a lineage that took over power from the 11th dynasty, that built a new capital city, but allowed provincial elites to continue in their strength up and down the Nile. And here you just see some, some areas where these provincial elites, landed aristocracy, your gentry, was able to maintain their strength, pass their power down from father to son to grandson, build tombs that did not need to be near the king's tomb, that, that showed their own kingly, mini kingly power in their own regional areas, that showed their own private armies, their wrestling holds, their weaponry, the amount of men that they had, how they could compete with the king and compete with one another. Well, all of this is what Sinwasra III strikes back against. And he uses what I like to call a carrot and stick approach. He is, and, and this is really hard to see. This is, these are archeological records. You're not able to, to find the actual and true story. This is an authoritarian regime that's not going to give us the realpolitik in a very clear way. They're going to obfuscate. They're going to use ideology to, to draw fog over all of this so that we can't see the clear reality. What we do see 
is, and I'm showing you the new purpose-built capital outside of Cairo built by CC um, right now is probably as we speak because that capital is being built at a 24 hour clip so that it can be finished to hit certain dates. But he's going to ask certain elites um, or demand, demand and ask, these two things will go together, to come to his capital city at Ichitawi near the Fayum. And he will grant them wonderful things like tombs of a size that, that they would not expect to have had at home. So he's rewarding them with riches and all kinds of extraordinary, rare and scarce resources from his um, sojourns to the south and to the north. He's able to bring in all kinds of wealth using his hegemony from Nubia and the Levant and thereby bring the elites closer to him. At the same time, emasculate them, enfeeble them, um, make them used to easy wealth, take them away from their provincial lands and from the leadership of those provincial lands. And you actually see the lineages shift. You can see in this particular case, there was a lineage from Khnumhotep I to Khnumhotep II at their homeland of Beni Hassan. They, that, that lineage has now been pulled to the capital. And you see Khnumhotep III at the capital, nestled right up to the king's pyramid, and their power, their independence has been taken from them, and they are now yes men of the king. And at the same time, Simwasu III empowers his own bureaucracy of yes men. Doesn't need these elites. He, he puts people in place around Egypt in replacement of these provincial elites to make decisions about taxes, who's getting resources, to, to make sure all of the bureaucracy happens as it should. And the comparison to Louis XIV, I think is a very good one because Louis XIV also used a carrot and stick approach to take lineages of provincial elites from around France, invite them to his new purpose-built capital at Versailles, surround them in their velvet prison of, of cushy, scarce resources, and very quickly within a couple of generations, enfeeble the entire game so much that even the kingship itself will be lost. The same will happen with Simwaster, well, it did happen with Simwaster III, because just a few generations later, we see the end of that dynasty. Under murky circumstances, he doesn't get his head cut off like Louis XVI, but it is dramatic nonetheless, and very quick to go from the height of prosperity and absolute auto autocratic control of your elites into a, a heap of destruction and nothingness to rebuild it all into something uh, decades later. So now we move to, I think, a high point for many people, which is Akhenaten, who started out his career as Amenhotep IV, named after his father Amenhotep III, who is the, the third in a long lineage of many kings named Amenhotep. And this king is, um, it's, it, he's a very interesting one. And I would say out of the book, which I have here, the good kings, right? Obviously it's a sly title trying to tell you that these kings are setting themselves up as moral and good leaders. But Akhenaten is pushing that farther than any of these kings. He's pushing that so far that he changes the religious ideology upon which kingship is based so that it serves him better. And it, it makes him uh, ungood, non-good. He, he becomes known as the heretic king but he's only able to do that because he comes from this lineage of good kings. So he imposes religious changes from the top down. You'll often read about this King Akhenaten, um, Amenhotep IV, and you might see that people like Egyptologists calling this a religious revolution. I vehemently disagree. This is anything but a revolution. This is not a bottom up affair. There's nothing grassroots about this. This is a top down authoritarian imposition that is only allowed because as the good king, God king, divine king, he is able to implement extraordinary change. And you could say that in other places in the ancient world, like the ancient Levant or Greece or Rome, where such authoritarian leadership was not allowed, where more competition, oligarchic competition was the order of the day, anybody who tried to implement such religious change from the top down would be dead within a couple of years, but not Akhenaten. He has 17 years to exercise this religious experiment of shock and awe, to change the way that his body looks, to, to make himself, in my opinion, and I write in more detail about this in the book, um, an image of light, of male and female, animal and human, 
um, all of these things encapsulated into his one divine form. He shows himself with his uh, great royal wife, Nefertiti, side by side. She accompanies him on this strange journey. And he starts right out of the gate within the first five years presenting us with, uh, I'm stealing a Kellyanne Conway quote here, of course, with some alternative facts. And those alternative facts are, um, I can celebrate a said festival, which is a, a festival of the tale, a renewal of kingship that is meant to be celebrated after 30 years. And he celebrates the said festival for the God, for the God Aten whom he has created. And you can see its beams coming down and bathing the body of the king with its glory. He puts all of his interest and intent on glorifying this sun disk in the sky and thereby raising up his own status as king beyond anything we had seen before. And here is a reconstruction of that said festival, that jubilee of kingship, which I, I, I really love it. I, I don't know how right on it is, but you can see the altars of, um, that, that he depicts um, shown in the distance, all of the people here. Um, there is the pageantry involved in the imposition of this religious shift and the new capital. Um, always be leery of new capitals. Washington DC is a new capital. Um, new capitals are a way of almost creating scorched earth without creating scorched earth. So instead of burning something down and starting anew, you just go out to someplace else, to some sort of unclaimed land and start anew. And the capital of Akhetaten, which is, will be very much like the name, the new name of the king, Amenhotep IV, Akhenaten, these two things are interlinked so that building and king, city and king are as one. And the success of this place is his own success. And at the same time that that capital is being built, he starts to change his name. And the shifts in his name are elemental. They are profound, unlike any shifts in an Egyptian name before. And when the king's name changes, the great royal, royal wife, her name changes, her headgear changes. She starts to wear um, a fabulous new crown that we had not seen before. She will eventually become co-king and maybe even sole king after his death. And at the same time, we see a new name for a new god, also put into the cartouche ring as if the god is the king and the king is the god and the two are interchangeable. Because Akhenaten is very clear to tell us that he is the only one who understands this divinity. Now he builds his capital city. If he moves in year five and he has a 17 year reign, it's gonna be less than a decade to build all of these, these structures, these giant uh, temples now unroofed because the only idol that is allowed is the sun in the sky. And the sun is there to eat all of its offerings with its own rays. And one could wonder if laying all of this food out on these offering tables is a means of Akhenaten showing a kind of prosperity gospel. And in the book, I compare it to our simple minds when our leaders don't give us economic wealth, um, a time period of great growth and expansion, we think it's the leader's fault. Even if the leader couldn't have grown or killed the economy in a certain amount of time, we will blame it on that leader. And in our simple human minds, we will equate whether or not that leader is blessed by God or not. Prosperity gospels are very useful because they work so well on us. And Akhenaten putting all of this food out in these temples to show how he's able to control these resources and control his elites thereby is a, a very powerful message. And you could argue that the temples that he's building showcase that prosperity gospel better than the temples previously, where things were hidden in the back for a very limited set of elites. Akhenaten needs to break all of this open for a new set of elites that he is empowering to see all of this um, with their own eyes. So this, this new co-opted elite you see them bowing down because now everyone has to bow down in Akhenaten's presence. There's no standing up straight anymore. Um, you can see them being co-opted in this perfected image of co-option. You've got Akhenaten and his great royal wife Nefertiti leaning out of this window of appearances with the sun shining behind them, maybe blinding the eyes of the people and distorting the king's body. But they're, they're getting solid gold trinkets and wonderful things. They're being given a recompense for their loyalty to this king. And Akhenaten, one can argue, looking at the titles and the names and the people he's bringing with him to this new capital, is creating an elite of new men, pushing aside the patrician class that was there before and making sure that he has as many yes men as he can. And those yes men 
they built this capital in a way that we are learning about now for the first time for its cruelty because bioarchaeologists are working um, right now, one of my graduate students, Nicholas Brown, is, is there in Egypt at, at Amarna. And the bioarchaeologist Gretchen Dabbs, um, her team is uncovering bodies that show uh, malnutrition, working with acute um, crisis in the body, um, working with long-term stress fractures and other things. Um, even one graveyard full of children who are separated from adults of any kind. And if the graveyard is any representation of how people were working in life, we're talking about work camp conditions. And these kinds of things go together with an autocracy that becomes more totalitarian, that becomes uh, more fanatical. And this is really, if you wanna take the whole book, this is the top of the whole wave in some ways, the fanaticism reaching its height. And thus it is no surprise that it's at this time that we see uh, a monotheism appearing for the first time. Now. If I want to start a bar fight amongst Egyptologists, I go to the bar and I say to the Egyptologist, was Akhenaten's religion monotheistic? And then just back away slowly and you've got it. This is uh, very debated, but I present you with one little snippet of one text that talks about the Aten's uniqueness, um, that there is only one, that he is better and bigger than everything else, that all of humanity and, and all of the world's creations are because of this one God. And um, looking at these texts and having studied them over the years and having grown up Roman Catholic, if um, Roman Catholicism with all of its saints and, and uh, its trinity get to be monotheist, then I think, you know, this can, <laughs> this can count. If you don't want to count it as monotheism, then you can say that this is the invention of the world's first religious political fanaticism. And that would be fine with me too. And then I think I have a quote coming. Oh no, and then this... Um, this lines up then, this first religious political fanaticism lines up with arguably the world's first iconoclasm. Because here you see an Amun figure with the two double plumes whose image was chiseled out. And you can see those chisels, those marks very clearly. It has been replaced by kings after Akhenaten, but he removed this image. He removed the word gods. He removed the name of Amun. He went around and, and had these things removed to elevate the Amen wherever he could, the Aten wherever he could. And um, the, these two things go, go hand in hand. Now, this is the quote that I was looking for. I'm quoting myself because I can't believe I wrote this and put it in print, but I'm, I'm doing this. So here, I'll be very clear with my opinion on Akhenaten's Egypt. I'm not saying that every practicing monotheist is an authoritarian, but I am saying that monotheism was specifically invented to support authoritarianism. And that is what the chapter is about, that in the, the years of the last years of the 18th dynasty, this was a way to grasp more total power than ever before through an ideological means, a religious means with the king as the chief priest at the top of that religious system. And we have all kinds of unintended consequences from these religious changes. We have a female king um, and we have the empowerment of this new class of new men many of them, most of them, coming from the military. And with this empowerment of military, you have many more unintended consequences that will lead very quickly to the fall of the 18th dynasty and to the birth of something very, very new. Because the 18th dynasty, you could argue, ends in a coup. It ends with the takeover of family power by bureaucrats and military men who then pull them power, that power to themselves. Um, that leads us really, really well into Ramses II, um, Ramses the populist, um, that, that king who is able to have mercenary origins um, from the Eastern Delta and yet consider himself a God King beyond reproach. He comes from Eastern Delta stock that links him to gods like Baal or Seth. And the name Seti is associated with Seth. Um, it is the name, the one of Seth. And Ramses II's family is gaining a tremendous amount of money in increased war making. It's bringing income and scarce resources into Egypt in extraordinary amounts such that they are able to create another group of new men. This time using the military base that they already have, but institutionalizing it, professionalizing it creating an institution of uh, military and an institution of temple. And it is at this time that 
the king is working not directly with provincial elites trying to get them to come to the capital, but is working with an institution of a temple, a corporation, if you like, and then working with masses of people as a populist king to get people to, to follow him and to create a base of populism. And this all starts with, with his father, Seti I. No surprise, however, that these kings, they're, they're new to the game. They're not of old Theban stock, they're of mercenary stock. And so it's not a surprise that Seti I and Ramses II are depicted in Seti I's temple to Osiris, standing in front of all of the names of the kings who had ever come before. The kings that are good, that is, Akhenaten is not included in this list. And this in one uh, religious stroke creates a lineage that goes from all of the, the kings from the oldest times, from the originator of kingship Menes, all the way to Ramses II himself, despite mercenary origins or being of Eastern Delta stock, it doesn't matter. Now, Ramses II knows he, he needs to please his base. He needs to please those corporations. He needs to build big and build a lot. So he is a king that is known for his quantity over quality. He is also known for the amount of reuse that he engages in because he's trying to build so much, he can't build it all from scratch. Sometimes that reuse is a little harder to see and there's more care taken in redoing the face and redoing the body as well as the text. Sometimes there's no care taken and they just add a text and the, the face and the body remain as they were before. This one is statue of Amenhotep III before him. He is creating a pageantry, a pageantry, a stage, uh, stages all over Egypt, up and down the Nile throughout the Delta to show his kingship to a different corporate lower elite of bureaucrats, soldiers, and priests. He engages in his own, um, this is from stealing from Bush Jr., mission accomplished. Even though the Battle of Kadesh in Syria was arguably a draw at best and a failure at worst, he is telling everyone that if it weren't for me, you would have all lost. He is there with his men, like Maximus and Gladiator. He's there uh, on the battlefield connecting. He's there showing himself on the chariot winning the day. He is, he is one of the guys, if you like. And that is a very different way of connecting with one's elites than what we saw with Khufu, right? So you can see the fashion of the, the game changing. You can say the way it's depicted changing. You can see how many elites are included changing. And you can draw conclusions about all of that by the size of the building, how many people get in, who the building is for, what the audience is. All of these things are, are visible in the archeological record such that a structure like this, Abu Simbel, was probably built to please a military populist base who's sta stationed down between the first and second cataracts in Nubia. They wanna see their king, they wanna see their celebrity, they wanna see their guy. And just like Akhenaten, he's showing himself big and he shows the god in between, quite small. So it's, it's, it's cleverly done. So he's a populist king and to get all of this done so quickly, he engages in nepotism on a scale that we have not visibly seen uh, really given to us with as much information before. They're showing the nepotism. If nepotism existed before, and of course it did, they're more canny with it, more, more careful about what they show and what they don't. Ramses II is not careful. He names 50 sons and 50 daughters. He sets them up with platforms to be the priest of Patah at Memphis, to be the, the great overseer or steward of, of this um, temple or that palace. And all of his sons, he names them to different places. This is the top of the wave. The seeds of the demise of this structure are already being sown. And it is no surprise when you see a tomb like KV-5, where the sons of Ramses II are, were meant to be interred, that you will have a very brutal aftermath just a few generations later, with a civil war almost certainly led by two different factions of Ramses II's own family. Um, there are many other comparisons I could make here, but we're, we gotta move along because um, I have like three minutes to get to Taharka, which is sad. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna talk a great deal about Taharka so that you guys have some ability to ask me questions about um, this, this lecture and this material. Taharka, I needed to include him because Taharka is there bringing all of the weight of colonialism, all of the things, the water in which the colonialism swims, why a, a king or a lineage from a place that had been 
just controlled and exploited and colonized brutally for millennia by the Egyptians would then turn towards Egyptian tropes and ideology when it takes over Egypt, even before it takes over Egypt and use it to create its own authoritarianism. One could argue that the millennia of oppression created a kind of kinder, gentler imperialism. And indeed the stila of Pianchi, which is a, a stila talking about how this dynasty of kings from modern day Sudan was able to take over all of Egypt as an imperial um, hegemony, how they were able to do that without that much bloodshed. The stila goes out of its way to say that they only went after those people that, that double dealt, that, that turned against them. Anyone who came forward and said, yep, I'll work with you, they took them into the fold and, and worked in an imperial way. Taharka shows himself worshiping Amun-Ra. Um, he shows himself in a more Nubian way with a different crown much of the time, but he takes on Egyptian language, Egyptian symbolism, the, ide the ideology of kingship because it works so well. And there are Southern forms and Northern forms, but really we're, the, the Nubians or the Kushites excel at taking this ideology of the ancient Egyptians by claiming that the South is the source of Egyptian power. This is where the water comes from. This is where the agricultural wealth comes from. This is the land of Osiris. This is the land of the eye of Ray. This is where the solar strength comes from. And by claiming that, they claim to be the most pious Egyptians ever as they go forth and conquer using all kinds of Egyptian tropes to do so. And the last point that, that I will make here is that this is, this is something that colonialism does. Colonialism takes our identities, it takes our names, it takes our, our um, religious past and it imposes new things upon us. And it is um, not a surprise that when those people who have been colonized and oppressed rise up, they must use those tropes, languages, names, symbols, religions of the dominant powerful culture. And I show here an image of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I'm not trying to equate Taharka with Martin Luther King Jr., but I am saying that even if you are fighting against the man, which Taharka was not because he was the man, um, you will still, to create your dominance, use the cultural tropes of the place that had come before. And I would remind you that underneath my name are Latin letters from the Romans who invaded Britain and, and that my last name, Cooney, is of the Irish who were invaded by the English who took those Latin letters and imposed them on the Irish and then that goes to the new world and it goes from there. So with that point having been made, I'm going to move forward and tell you that with each fall of one of these dynasties, Another one will take its place. And as we move forward into the world, and this is the ancient world, as you can see going up to the British Empire of the 19th century, that each time there is a fall and a reconstitution, it gets bigger. And each time these patriarchal systems demand more, they hoard more resources, they control more people, they engage in punishments that are public, that are meant to keep people in line, they commodify females and they commodify children. They keep an elite well ensconced and everyone else looking on to that elite in a trickle down kind of economy. And I think this could go on for much longer. We could keep those spikes going up and up and up. We fall, it goes up again. But there is a, a bit of a game changer that we talk about all the time, which is our mother earth, who is now putting some hard stops in the way for how much more we can continue this authoritarian up and down bell curve pattern that we have been on for so long. Um, and so I'll leave it with that last burning question of will, if we have another fall, what will we be able to build it into? And now that we are globalized as almost a kind of global authoritarian regime linked by stock markets and um, the sale of $300 million paintings, how are we going to, to understand our future going forward? So I will turn it over to Bianca who gets to ask a very few questions from all of you. Oh, that was so interesting, Kara. Thank you so much for, for trying to squeeze as much as you can into that less than an hour presentation. We're all gonna have to buy your book and read it for ourselves. In fact, I'm going to send a link right here to where we can order your book uh, signed from Book Soup. 
um, so people can catch up on anything that we weren't able to hear from you today. Um, yes, we only have time for a question or two. Um, I know you said we might touch on Muon examinations in Q&A, and I'm wondering if you think we should chat about that or if we should pick like one or two from the 23 that are here. As you like, and go ahead, Bianca, and send me the questions when you're done too, and I can try to hit some of those. Um, maybe I'll do it in my podcast or something because <laughs> there are so many, so that's a good idea. Okay, yeah. cool. I absolutely will send the, the report to you. Um, Robert asks, uh, in reference to the kings bringing the elites together and emasculating them, like Louis the Sun King did with Versailles, using the carrot and stick ideology, do you think that is the first step to authoritarianism? Oh no, it's the last. The, the, the authoritarianism at the beginning needs to link all of these guys together, usually as warriors. And there's usually a kind of warrior ideology. And if you think of like the beginning of the 11th, 12th dynasty, beginning of the 18th dynasty, you see the king going hunting with his guys and hanging out with his warrior guys. And there's like a brotherhood of men. That's where it starts. And then once the, the tribute and the wealth becomes more excessive and the ability for the god king heightens to do some things that he would like to do and his own divinization increases, that's where the... The elites are being um, rewarded as well, and their status is going up as well. That's where the, the authoritarian leader might then push back. I would say it's the very, it's the height, but it's the beginning of the very end of it when he pushes back against those empowered elites. And it is a, something that I think you could look at a, a, in authoritarian regimes across the board and see when you finally strike back against your elites who are your last support, the ones who make it so your head doesn't get cut off. And, um, and, and see what kind of comparisons you could make. Thank you. And on the other side of this, Roni wonders what kind of world you envision post-authoritarianism. Yeah, that's what the last chapter of my book is about. It's, um, it's called Breaking Up with Pharaoh <laughs> and how we're still in a relationship with Pharaoh, whether we call him Jeff Bezos or, or Trump or Putin or, or whatever. Our system is not meant to be representative. It's not meant to serve the majority, it's meant to serve minorities, and it's meant to serve the rich. And what I see going forward is a lot of attempts to keep the same smash and grab patriarchal systems of inequality because it serves the few. And you, you know, they, they always say that, that you get the most bombs dropped right before the armistice is signed. And I would say that what we are going through right now is a grassroots system that is, that is changing what sexuality is, what marriage is, how you have children, who gets to work, how we're all overworked in a capitalist, late capitalist system. Um, all of these things are changing at the bottom of society such that people are opting out in their own ways of a traditional patriarchal system. And then the top of society is pushing back saying, being gay is evil, transgenderism is being imposed on children. What is racism? It makes us not proud of our own white heritage and CRT is being taught in schools and all of these things. So there is a great amount of push and pull, a huge amount of tension from the top of society against the bottom of society. And there's a lot of co-option. There's a lot of um, attention to the top of society to certain minority parts at the bottom of society who will then be their base to keep an evangelical fundamentalist religion going to keep people in place to pass laws in Texas that force pregnancies on women, et cetera. So as this moves forward, and these th as, this is my historian's mindset, these things take a long time. They take decades, they take generations. Um, let's give this another 50 to 70 years of this kind of tension. I know nobody wants that, but that's the way these things work. Um, maybe even a few centuries. And then there will come a point, in my opinion, when either we, we, the authoritarians win and the earth loses and we all go down in a big flaming heap of I don't know what, or we create some sort of sustainability that is demanded by the strictures of just living on a planet that can't take 8 billion people and, and the people that want to live in a certain way. And so and the, the, this, is, this is the messy part because I can't tell you what's going to happen because we haven't invented it yet. And in my opinion, we are going through another human revolution as we speak. We went through an agricultural revolution. We went through an industrial revolution. We went through a sexual revolution because I'm standing here, I'm sitting here talking. We are now going through a revolution that is an anti-patriarchal revolution. But 
what form that takes and how we get through that fire is uh, something I think about every day, but I don't know exactly what it will be, um, but it will have to change one main thing. And that one main thing is the idea of growth at any cost, because that is where, or that is how our economic systems are based. That is how our family power is often based. Um, that is how material goods are hoarded. These ideas of growth, we are going to have to create something that, um, that, that is more sustainable. And we are all asking what that sustainability is. And that's very much what this book is trying to, to ask and to answer. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Kara Cooney. And thank you to everyone who joined us. This program has been recorded. It's available immediately on our Facebook. And in a few days, it'll be uploaded to our Instagram onto the Fowler website for you to share as you see fit. We hope you'll join us for our next program. You can find information about it on the closing slide. Thanks again, Kara. Appreciate you. Have a good thank evening, you. everyone. Bye.